Good evening. Uh, we're back into our series called Uncommon Sense. We started just a few weeks ago. We, we realized that uh, common sense is not very common, hence the name of our series. The theme verse for our series uh, was over in Proverbs 10.21. It said, fools are destroyed by their lack of common sense. We all agreed in week one that we didn't want to be fools, and we made some bad decisions in, the, in our life, uh, and, and uh, we've had some bad results because of it. Uh, but we don't want to be fools. We've, we've acted the fool, but we don't want to be one. And so we want to gain some common sense. We've been kind of uh, up on that airplane uh, for the last couple of weeks where we're trying to soar a little bit higher instead of being down here making our own choices and making mistakes. We wanted to climb up a bit higher uh, and, and let uh, deity make choices for us. And that's why we talked about uh, that other proverb that said that we're not supposed to lean on our own understanding, but we're to seek God's will in everything we do so that he can direct our paths, so you can make straight our paths. You know, I want to go on the, the straight path, the, the path that's not filled with potholes and cliffs, and I don't want to be find, found out in the ditch. And so I want to make some good choices uh, so we can have some uh, good results. Uh, I, I, I was uh, thinking this, this week while I was preparing that uh, over the last 10 years or so that I've been uh, standing up before congregations here and there, and, and preaching God's Word, and some of the subjects that, that I, I preach about, although, you know, I spend time, and I study, and I, and I get my, I Google stuff, and I look at my commentaries, and, 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 and concordances, and all these different things, but, but sometimes, <clears throat> you know, I, you preach on something, and, and it's not exactly for everybody, uh, although we can all glean something every time someone shares the Word of God, it's not always apropos for that person you know, like, it's not hitting them right where they're at at times. You know, you get in and um, you hear the pastor, he's talking about parenting, you don't have any kids. Uh, you're not even close to having kids. Uh, maybe you're already way past having kids. You could talk about marriage, but you're single. Or uh, financial stewardship, maybe eschatology. Uh, does anyone even uh, care what eschatology is? Or does anyone even know what eschatology is? What's well, end times stuff and... You know, maybe you don't, that's not a big thing to you. Maybe you could talk about Bible prophecy or creation. Was it six literal days? Was it six time periods? I mean, nobody was there. I don't know. Uh, some people don't care. We could talk about the importance of evangelism and reaching the ends of the earth with the, the good news. We could talk about, you know, being missional. Get on, the, get on your job. Get, get going. Let's go. Let's go. Hoorah. Uh, we could talk about God's grace. We all need it. If you're a Christian, you've received it. We could talk about God's wrath. Uh, a lot of different things we could talk about, but sometimes uh, it's just not going to hit you. I've been in the seats before at churches, too, where I wasn't preaching. And the guy's up there talking about something. It's good stuff, but it's just not meeting me where I'm at. Well, I've been doing this now, like I said, for about 10 years or so. And to the best of my ability, I could say that I've probably preached somewhere at the ballpark of about 500 sermons. But as I was thinking about it this week, I... I I was thinking about, you know, that of all the sermons I've ever, ever preached, I've never been so sure that this is for the entire congregation. No matter who walks in that door, this is for everybody. Let me, let me tell you why. We'll see if, if this is an accurate assumption. Uh, the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. We've heard this, this verse uh, countless times. Well, let's just talk for a moment about what this really means. This glorious standard of God's. Basically what it is, is, is holy perfection. You got to understand that God's standard, it's holy perfect. Like he is holy. He is completely set apart. He is unlike us. He is different than we are. Just as the heavens are above the earth, so are his ways higher than our ways. And so are his thoughts higher than our thoughts. He's completely different. He's, he's everywhere at one time. He sees all things. He knows all things. He spoke and planets came out of his mouth. Like, nobody could do that. Can you do that? Nobody could do that. Okay, he's totally different. So this holy perfection of God is a standard that we're, we're shooting for, and no one can ever get there. And so when you look in the rearview mirror of your life, 
Do you, has anyone in here ever seen holy and perfect? No. As a matter of fact, we look back into our rearview mirror, we might see a bit bumpy road back there. Some of us might see some potholes. Some of us might see the cliff. Some of us look back there and see an absolute train wreck. We see a, a trail of busted relationships and horrible decisions with horrible results. And somewhere in that mess in the rearview mirror, well, no doubt you've certainly hurt some people. And surely someone also has hurt you. Perhaps they've taken something of value from you, whether it's uh, material uh, of, of, of monetary value, perhaps they've taken some time from you that you didn't want to give them, perhaps they took a purity from you that you were not ready to give up to them. You've been offended, insulted, disappointed. You've set some expectations for people or situations or relationships and they have not been met. The bottom line is that someone has made a transaction in your life that has left you feeling like less than you were. And so if I was to put up here on the screen this quote, what you did left me hurting and left claiming that quote blank, could we not all put our name in there? What you did left me hurting. Yeah, see, we could all put our name up there because we've all experienced that. But let me ask you a question. Do you see a problem with that quote? See, I see a problem. I don't know if you see it, but I see a problem. The problem with what you did left me hurting is this, that the person of action does not receive the results. Sadly, the person acted upon carries the wound. And so if you've ever been acted upon, well then, this message from God's word is for you. And since everyone would raise their hand, then that means the message from God's word tonight is for all of us. Here's the first thing I want to talk about. If you're acted upon wrongly, Christianity doesn't say that you can't be hurt. It doesn't say that you can't be angry or sad. As a matter of fact, I would offer you that you can be all of those things. And I would offer it to you biblically, not just my opinion. The guy who wrote most, most of the Proverbs, Solomon, also wrote another book of the Bible called Ecclesiastes. It's right there in the same area of the scriptures. Well, in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 4, this smartest man who ever lived, the guy who God let experience all the opulence and abundance of all the things we all desire to, to, to enjoy, he enjoyed them and then he could tell us about the results of that enjoyment so that we could decide whether we wanted to go down that same path. He said this, Ecclesiastes 3, 4, there's a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance. Biblical permission granted to be hurt, to be angry, to be sad, to grieve. It's in there. And then look here. It doesn't just stop there. Listen up. Romans 12, 15 tells us that we should weep with those who weep. So not only is it okay biblically to be upset or sad or grieve because someone has acted upon you wrongly, but it's also awesome to be a friend to be a Christian brother or sister that will come along someone who's hurting and upset and angry and grieving and be upset with them, be sad with them, to grieve with them. But listen, it's for a season. It's for a season, remember? Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 3.4, it's a season. There's a season to cry. There's a season to laugh. There's a season to grieve and a season to to dance. And with the word season, the implication is that there would be an off season. See, the NFL doesn't play all year. Their, their season doesn't last all year. The NBA, they don't play all year. Their season's not all year. There's an off season. So with any season, there's an off season. And what I mean by this is that God doesn't 
he he want, he wants to give you the permission to be upset and sad or grieved, but he doesn't want you to carry that wound forever. The problem with carrying the wound forever is that you, you can't be all that God wants you to be if you do. You see, you, you can't love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength when your mind and your heart are cancered and, and bitter with, with, with hatred and, and sadness and upset over something. And, and, it's, and you're holding on to this thing and you won't, you won't let it go. See, there's something that you need. There's a key ingredient to get rid of all that so that you can love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. You can't, you can't love your neighbor as yourself if you can't stand that person. And you're angry with them because of what they did. You can't be like, like Jesus told us to love one another as he has loved us. We can't do that when our heart is filled with, un, with, with, with pain and hurt and upset and grieving and loss and I'm mad and I'm sad. I can't. How can I love? See, there's a key ingredient that we all need in order to get this done. Share that key ingredient with you. Now listen. At the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the cross. And at that cross, all mankind is offered undeserved, unearned. I'm not looking for it. I'm not seeking it. It's unmerited. I don't want it even. Jesus gives us forgiveness of all of our sin, even though we didn't deserve it. Weren't looking for it, nothing. See, that's the main ingredient that we need to get a hold of, forgiveness. And I can ask you tonight, have you received that gift? If you've received that gift, praise God for that. But there needs to be a reaction. There has to be a response. I mean, if you receive this gift, if, the, if, if the, the king of the universe, the creator of everything, has given you unmerited favor and has given you, given you forgiveness for this huge pile of sin that you've given him, how do we respond to that? Well, I'm going to give you a couple of options. But here's the first one. Here's the first one, radical obedience. This is my favorite one. I love radical obedience. I've been saying since this church started, our, our motto here is, uh, we, it's based on the Bible. It's open it, read it, do it. See, it's in radical obedience where, 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 where God's greatest blessings flow down to the follower of Christ. When he says do something, we do it. Blessing. I, 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 you know, in certain things, I, I, I'm totally radically obedient. You know, when it comes to like sharing the gospel, telling people about Jesus, I'm totally into radical obedience. I have been radically saved. I realize my need for a savior. I embrace Christ as my savior. I'm absolutely just like Paul. It's like I'm compelled to, to tell people about Jesus. Woe to me if I do not preach, Paul said. I feel that same way. He said, I believe, therefore I speak. I'm totally that. Like I'll I'll tell you put me in front of anybody, whether it's one person or 50,000 in a stadium, I will fearlessly tell them about Jesus. I cannot help to do it. But the problem is, is that we're not talking about evangelism here. So I'm all in on that. He said, go, go make disciples. Teach them all the time. I'm in. Done. But that's not what we're, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about forgiveness. And so here's, here's what it says. See, I'm not very, well, I, I had to admit that, you know, I'm not really good at that. A couple weeks ago, I remember I told you, I, I, we, please pray for me because I, I have a hard time forgiving some people that hurt me. But this is what the Bible says, though. Colossians 3.13 says, remember the Lord forgave you, so you must must forgive others. See, it's not a suggestion or it's not an offer with multiple choice whether I want to do this or maybe do that. See, there's no wiggle room in the word must. He forgave you. So if your Savior and Lord are Jesus Christ and he says you must, well then, 
what do you got to do? You must. Okay, but some of us don't. And, and, and there's grace there. But, but what he really wants is radical obedience. He said to, I do it, done. That's what needs to be done. Radical obedience. Well, perhaps for some of us, that takes. And we're obedient. He says, forgive, and we do. Awesome. <clears throat> well, sometimes it doesn't. C.S. Lewis, the guy who wrote Chronicles of Narnia and all, he said this, everybody says that forgiveness is a lovely idea until he has something or someone to forgive. Anyone? Well, let me love you well, revolution, right here. Listen to me. You should do this. You should do this. Remember that the Lord forgave you and forgive others. You should do this. God's greatest blessings flow to those who are obedient. But, to love you well, I must tell you that I certainly understand that it's very, very hard to pull this off. I say this because I can tell you that personally, I have been raked over the coals of hurt and offense by people I love and trusted. In family life, in ministry, from just friends, raked over the coals. So listen. If, and it's a big if, but if you can grab a hold of radical obedience, that is awesome. And if you can, you are well on your way to freedom and healing and power. But, if you can't, I need you to listen up. Before I tell you what I'm about to say, I'm going to say that this is a tough thing to tell you what I'm about to tell you. Matter of fact, over in John 6, 60, the disciples are listening to Jesus teach, and sometimes Jesus teaches things that are pretty tough, right? And the disciples say, well, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And we've probably all been at that place. We're reading something in the scripture that God says we should or shouldn't do, and we're like, man, this is a tough one. So we've been there. And what I'm about to share with you is one of those moments so please give me grace in this. Listen, if you can grab a hold of radical obedience and just absolutely forgive people just as the Lord has forgiven you, awesome. But if there's a lack of forgiveness, that lack of forgiveness will absolutely dismantle and kill everything that Jesus died for. Let me tell you what I mean. Jesus died for a lot of reasons. But there's two biggies that we can all agree on. One, it's to restore the relationship between God and man. The scriptures say that we were once enemies of God because of our evil thoughts and actions. But through Christ's death on the cross, he has brought us back into his presence, holy, blameless, and without single fault. Our relationship restored through Christ's death. The other relationship is that he's, he's, he's died so that we, he can reconcile people back to one another. In Romans 12, 5, it says that we belong to each other. It's not just that we're going to be buddies. Like, we belong. There's, a, there's, there's, some, there's some glue in that relationship. Like, you own me. I own you. We have a relationship that's very, very strong, very tight, and not to be broken. That's what Christ did on the cross. In the scriptures in Colossians 3.11, it says, in this new life. See, he's talking about, like, in, in, in the book, one of the books to, to the Corinthians, Paul said, if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has died, the new. Behold, the new man. And he says in Colossians 
3.11 that in this new life as Christians, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. This is just a short list of all the different types of people that Christ has brought together. It goes on to say that Christ is all that matters. He lives in all of us. In this new life as the church, the, the followers of Christ, it doesn't matter if we're all different. He brings us all together as one. As a matter of fact, over in, in Ephesians, just two books back, uh, Paul, under the same inspiration of the same Holy Spirit, says, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. Do you know who Jews and Gentiles are? Yeah, it's me and the rest of you. It's Jewish people and those that are not. That covers every person on earth. He's, he's united everyone on earth into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people. See how he's bringing them together? Creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body. Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility toward each other was put to death. So you see both the things he's done there on the cross are in that one verse. Together as one body, so he brought us together. Christ reconciled both groups to God. So together and then back to God. And that there's the walls of hostility are gone. So if there's any wall of hostility between you and another person, it's a figment of your imagination. It's something you're creating because Christ already got rid of it. One body, many different types of people coming together. That's what Christ did. And without forgiveness, ruining this. Here we are in Proverbs. We finally got here. Sermon on Proverbs. Here's, here's a proverb. Proverbs 17, 9 says, Love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. See, we're talking about what, what Jesus did on the cross. Will it prosper or will we kill it? Will we dismantle it? Well, he says, Love prospers when the fault is forgiven. See, there's our key ingredient forgiveness. That's when relationships excel and soar and flourish. But dwelling on it, it says, like no forgiveness, like I'm, I'm sitting right here. I'm dwelling on this thing. You hurt me. You offended me. You stole from me. And so I'm, I'm dwelling on that. I'm, I'm hanging out right here. This is where it happened. This is how you made me feel. And I'm going to keep it right here. It separates close friends. Do you see the power of an unforgiven offense here? Close, it separates close friends. Think about that. In, in a lifetime, how many of us will have, uh, you know, close friends? Like, we all have acquaintances and business partners and associates and this and that. But how many people can we honestly say are close friends? One hand? Can you count them on one hand? Maybe two if you're real fortunate? And, and these close friends, like, you don't just grab a guy off the, off the side of the street and say, oh, you're my close friend. It doesn't work that way. To become close friends, it's investment, time, energy, experiences together. You, you know, it's not something that's just done overnight. It's something that's created over years. It takes time to develop it. And this says that after all these years of developing it, developing it, developing it, creating it, building it, that in seconds we destroy it when an offense is not forgiven. I had an experience like that, and I could speak to this. It's truth. I had a best friend. We've been best friends since we were in high school. Did everything together, completely unseparated at all times. I did something that probably wasn't the greatest thing in the world, but it was not a big deal. I simply, uh, this is what happened. He has a job that's a very good job, makes a ton of money. He's a man of of great influence and authority and, and prosperity and he's well respected in his in his field well I had a job and it wasn't nearly what his was but it was important to me and that person was gonna come 
take a test drive in a car where I was working at the dealership because the new Hemi was coming out in the 300. And, and he wanted to drive it. And he wanted to see how much power it had, but he wasn't going to buy it. He already told me because in his company, they give him a free car. He wasn't going to buy the car, but he wanted to test drive it just for fun. And I said, no problem. Come on down. Come on down this weekend. So he's like, all right, I'll be in town this weekend, actually. I'll come down. Perfect. So he was going to come down. Well, what I did know is that I had training through the Chrysler Corporation. I had to be in Orlando that weekend. And so I wasn't going to be at the store. And it was thrown upon me last minute. I had no choice. It was mandatory. You had to go. Well, I forgot to call my buddy to tell him I wasn't going to be at the store. So he drove down to the store. The store is in Mount Dora. He lived in Lake Mary. Not that big of a drive. 20 minutes. 25 minutes. But he came and I wasn't there. He's pretty disappointed in me. Because I didn't call and tell him. Was I wrong? Yes. Was it a mistake? Yes. Did I mean harm? No. Have I spoken to him since? And that was 2004, I think. No. I've not spoken to him one time. He won't forgive me. I begged him. I have emailed him, called him, texted him, sent letters to his house, Christmas cards to his house. Please, I begged his wife, please tell him that I love him and I'm sorry. You know, like I took it all on myself. Like I, it's totally my fault. Please forgive me. Nothing. He wouldn't forgive me. I tried. He wouldn't. So, t almost 20 years of best friends gone in a moment because he's dwelling on it. No forgiveness of the offense. You know, recently I went over to the uh, jail here to visit one of you. <laughs> I go there too often, I have to say, and I hate going there. Um, but what, the part that I hate the least uh, the most, I should say, is that is when you when you first check in, you check in, you give your license, and uh, they call uh, back to the pod where the prisoner is that you're going to see, and uh, they have call them down so they can meet you in the the room, and they take your license and they oh, press a button and it opens up this sliding heavy steel door, you know, and you walk in, then it goes and closes behind you, and once that's closed. Then they press the button so the door in front of you can open up and you can go into the back where the prisoners are. Well, I hate that moment when you're in there. At that moment, you're completely isolated. You're in jail, right? And what happens sometimes is that they open the door, you walk in, and it closes, and then the lady behind the counter who's supposed to press the button to open up the second door, she gets busy talking to someone else, and you end up standing in there for a couple minutes, and it's like, wait a minute, I'm in jail now. Let me out of here. You know, I can't get out. And you feel isolated and powerless. And it's a creepy, awful feeling. And I hate it. And let me tell you something. If you've ever been acted upon and, and the recollection of it draws up bitterness and rage and revenge and hate and those emotions are stirred up at the thought of what happened, then listen, you're in jail like I was. That's the way you are. Inside that, isolated and powerless. It owns you. And, and you're choosing to let the person who wronged you hold the key to yourself. And there's no power there. Does the Bible teach this? This example I'm giving you? I would tell, tell you that it does. Go back to the book of Proverbs and look at Proverbs 18, 19. It says, An offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Listen, when I, when I share the scriptures with you, I've told you many times, read with imagination. Envision it. Be in the story. Think about it. An offended friend, like my friend was, he was offended. He's harder to win back than in a fortified city. Lockdown, dude. Lockdown. A fortified city. Think about the fortified city. The big walls. The cannons on the top. The archers with the with the arrows with the flames on them. And, and, the, and the moat around the castle with the, the water. The alligators. And like, you ain't getting in, dude. 
Locked out. And that's exactly what happened with my friend. I couldn't get in. He put up a wall that I was not getting into because of unforgiveness. It goes on to say that arguments separate friends, there it is again, like a gate locked with bars. Let's just call it what it is. What's an argument? Every argument that we have with anybody is what? I'm right. No. I'm right. No. I'm right. No. I'm right. And every time, the heels dig in deeper, and I hold my position. I'm dwelling on the offense. This is what I think. I'm not letting you go. You hurt me. You took from me. You offended me. I'm right. And I'm holding my ground. And you better, better admit your fault. And you better, better compensate me for what you took and how you hurt me. And if you beg me, maybe, just maybe, I'll release you from this debt. Uh, news flash. They ain't in jail. You are. Because if someone has to do something to make you better, then they hold the key to your happiness and your freedom. Bro, you're in jail. I don't know who said this, but I heard it said that forgiveness does not change the past, but it does enlarge the future. It's so true these words are. I can't forgive someone and go back in time. This is not back to the future with a flux capacitor or some time machine to make this thing go away. Like, it happened. It happened. But, it may have controlled your past. It's what happened. It, it, but if you want to get out of jail, and you're tired of feeling the crushing effects of what someone else did, and you're tired, like, you realize that this person or this thing that it dictated my, my past, my thoughts, my feelings, the way I lived in the past, but it's not going to affect my future. I'm going to take back my power. I got to forgive for this to happen. I have to forgive for this to happen. I forgive. It makes the power back to me. See, our culture teaches also that forgiving is weakness. You know, don't be a doormat. Don't let them walk all over you. They hurt you. You hurt them. It's eye for an eye, bro. You know, that people that don't even believe that don't even believe in God, they go Old Testament on you. Eye for an eye, man. Eye for an eye. Well, this guy's not a Christian by any means, but correct in what he says. Nevertheless, Mahatma Gandhi, the old uh, leader of India. He said that the weak can never forgive. But the forgiveness is the attribute, is the attribute of the strong. Likewise, 18, back in the 1800s here in the States, this American preacher, E.H. Chapin, Edwin Hubble Chapin, said, Never does the human soul appear so strong as when it forgoes revenge and dares to forgive an injury. I love the word that he uses there. Dares to forgive. Like, he's, it's a dare. Like, you're going out on a limb here, man. No guarantees. This, this is going to be hard. But when you do it, when you dare to forgive an injury, man, is that strong. See, choosing to forgive returns your power back to its original and proper owner, which is you. Someone else doesn't hold the key to your jail cell anymore, you do. And if you want out, you need to put the key in the hole, and the key is forgiveness. You would see the movie The War Room? Awesome movie, right? Love that little old lady. In her closet, praying like crazy. That's where her and God hang out. You know, I got a war room. You guys got a war room? We should all have a war room. You know what my war room is? It's the shower. That's what you know. It's weird. Like, I love the shower. I love the showers. My war room. Like, it's the same as that old lady. Like, I, the only problem is I can't put little pieces. Of, I can't tape the little pieces of paper on the wall in the shower. But it's where God shows up. You know, like I know He's everywhere at all times, but for some reason He likes to hang out in my shower. 
But what about the shower that's right here for him the most? I was in the shower the other day, and of course I'm studying through the Proverbs and getting ready to preach this message to you. And of course, like all the time, the reason that I'm preaching something is because God's teaching me something, and I just share it with you. Remember a few weeks ago, like I said, I asked you to pray for me because I have a hard time forgiving people that have hurt me. And so while I'm preaching, uh, while I'm, I'm, I'm learning about forgiveness, of course God's working on me about that very same matter, and I'm in the shower, and all of a sudden it dawns, I need to forgive these people. Because when I start, think about certain people in certain situations, I get things stirred up inside of me that are not what God will want. And these people own me. These offenses own me. They control how I think and feel. It's ridiculous. And so I started naming the people and naming the offense. I could see them in my mind, their faces, and what they did. And I began to lay those things at the cross and give them to God and say, Lord, I forgive this person for this. And I forgive that person for that, specifically. And you know what's amazing? What I did I got out of that shower, I walked into the kitchen, saw Meredith, and I had a smile from ear to ear, healed. I was happy. I was restored. I had the power. No longer did these people and what they did control how I think and feel. I control it. I took my power back. Okay, so people say forgiveness is strength. You know, Gandhi and, and Pastor Chapin, but, but, but does God's word say that? Or does it say that you're weakly when you forgive? Well, look at Proverbs 19.11. See what it says. It says that people earn respect by overlooking wrongs. They earn respect by overlooking wrongs. By forgiving, they earn respect. Well, let me just say that we might not always like a powerful person, but we always respect their power. And God says that forgiving people are powerful people. The ones who forgive earn respect. They're powerful. Forgiveness is a choice of my will, not yours. It's my power to decide how I'm going to live. I'm not leaving that up to you. In other words, no matter, if I choose to love and forgive you, that no matter what you do, I still choose to love you. I still have my power. I'm not giving it to you. I'm not willing to give it to you. I decide. I forgive. You and your deed no longer own me. I'm free. I'm restored I'm powerful. Now, most of us have been taught, if not all, that we should forgive, but don't forget. Well, let me uh, give you this other quote, an anonymous source. It says, I can forgive, but I can't forget is yet another way of saying I can't forgive. And I couldn't agree more. See, everyone teaches you to forgive but don't forget. Because if you, if, you, if you forget, then you'd be a fool because they'll do it again. Well, that sounds good. Except, let me share this with you. Um, we ask, first, let me ask you a question. Where do we look at the Bible to find out what real love is? The, the, the love verses. In 1 Corinthians 13. The, the verses that we preach at every wedding. Love is this, love is that, love is that. Well, guess what? 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Love keeps no record of being wronged. Okay? It doesn't remember it. It chooses to forget it. It chooses to get rid of it. Just like God chooses to forgive sin and cast it into the deepest oceans and as far as the east is to the west. In other words, I'm choosing to get rid of it. I'm choosing to forgive and forget. It's gone. And we're supposed to be not like the world, right, that teaches forgive, not forget. Now, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think, Romans 12, 2. Don't be like the world, 
Romans 8, 20, uh, I'm sorry, Ephesians 8, 29 says to be conformed to the image of Christ. Don't be like the world and what it does. Forgive but not forget. Be like Christ who forgives and forgets. Hebrews 8, 12 says this, I will forgive their wickedness. That's step one. And I will never again remember their sins. I will forgive them and I choose to forget them. Done. Forgive and forget. That's what we're supposed to do. Now, as I told you earlier, John 6.60 says this is a difficult teaching. Who can accept it? Here comes another one. And I need your grace. Hear me out on this one. Speaking of forgive and forget. 9-11 was a bad day, wasn't it? Several years ago, the planes went through the building and all these people perished. It was a horrible day. Horrible day. Not just for our nation, but for the world. Just a horrible day. <clears throat> Every year on Facebook and on bumper stickers and somewhere that you see this, 9-11, it says, never forget. But I understand we should not forget the ones that we lost Hold on to their legacy or remember them fondly. Pray for their families. But listen, never forget. Never forget. We're remembering such a great and wicked sin. Such an awful, awful experience. Such a terrible, disgusting event. Well, it only conjures up hate and sadness and anger and revenge and loss. We, 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 we tend to start hating the people who did it. We get angry. We want to pay them back. Let me ask you a question. Do you know why these people did this to us? Because they don't know what love is. And it said earlier, love is prospers when a fault is forgiven. And these people don't know what love is. And when we don't forgive and forget, and we start remembering what happened, their sin, their disgusting act, stirs up, when that stirs up in you the same feelings towards them that inspired their heinous crime in the first place, well then evil just won. Love isn't prospering there. God forgives and forgets. I mean, listen, on the cross itself, as Jesus is whipped and beaten and stretched and nailed and insulted and spit on and slapped and stripped and killed, just before he dies, he says to his Father in heaven, forgive these people. know not what they do. And these people that put the blades through the buildings, they know not what they do. They thought they were doing right. Just like the Roman soldiers thought they were doing right. And Jesus said, forgive them. As the body of Christ, we need to get this. Forgiveness is everything. It's at the heart of the gospel. It is a local expression of the body known as revolution. We need this to be healthy. Josh McDowell says that forgiveness is the oil of relationships. The you know, oil kills friction. Oil helps things run smooth and run long. And here's the problem. We don't have enough of that. And that's why the church door, it, it, it must just be a revolving door. Because we don't have this. See, remember Colossians 3.11, I said that there was all types of, of people into one body, slave, free, religious, barbarian, uncivilized, you know, all kinds of different people, right? Well, you think an uncivilized barbarian might offend you? Well, of course. I mean, look at the guy next to you in your seat. Look at the look at the barbarian next to you and say hello to him. Well, of course they're going to offend you. Of course they're going to hurt you. 
it's just who we are. We're all different types of people with different opinions on everything, different styles, different approaches, different perspectives. We're always going to hurt each other. And the only way that this thing's going to work is if we already, if we give them forgiveness. We know it's coming. So if we know that there's all different types of people in our church that look different, talk different, act different, different styles, I like this, you don't like that, you said this, I don't like, we offend each other, we, we upset each other, we disappoint each other, we have expectations for one another that we don't meet. Okay, all the time. Let's be ready for that to be a healthy church. So if Colossians 3.11 says there's all these different types of people in the church, okay, great. Well, how do we make it work then? Well, he goes on to tell us. Since God chose you, in the very next verse, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, in other words, all the, we're, we're different than everybody else. So in the rest of the world, if there's all different types of people, we tend to flock with those that we're like. We, we gravitate towards the people that we're similar with because we don't want to be hurt. We don't want to be offended. We don't have to deal with everyone else's junk because they're different than me. They're going to hurt me. I don't like them. Well, he says you're supposed to be holy people, different than everyone else. you got to deal with all these different types of people with all the different ways and work it out as one body. So he says another word, the only way to do it, he goes on to say, is you must clothe yourself. That means first thing in the morning, I'll put my clothing on, right? First thing in the morning, put this clothing on that he's about to tell us. This is who I'm going to be. You ready? First thing, I wake up, this is who I'm going to be. Tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. The list goes on. Make allowance for each other's faults. And forgive anyone who offends you. Here's, this, here's where it gets tight. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together. So not only has he brought us all together on the cross, but here's what's going to keep us all together. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your heart. Don't let anything else rule. Let this rule. For as members of one body, you're called to live in peace. Listen, the only way we're to bind together, to stay together, to be a healthy church that's growing and healthy and full of love and working well, so it's not a revolving door, is if we do these things, if we have tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, and allowance for fault, and forgiving offense, and loving one another, that's what will keep us together in perfect Harmony. Harmony means we're all different. But we work it out. And we stay together. Harmony is, you know, when you're singing, harmony is this. One voice, beautiful voice. This voice over here, beautiful voice. They sound great, but when you put them together, they're even more beautiful. Harmony is, is when you combine different voices to create a more beautiful sound that any one singular voice could create on its own. But it implies that there's different types of people. And different types of people aren't going to live up to your expectations. They're going to offend you and disappoint you and not meet your expectation. But he says to clothe yourselves in tender heart of mercy. In other words, what they deserve is, is you to be angry with them, but, but don't be. He says to clothe yourself in kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. We're going to need these things because they're going to disappoint us. They're going to offend us. We're going to be hurt. They're going to take things from us. They're going to hurt us. But if we're ready, it will work. You see, isn't this list that I just read to you, isn't it the exact list we need to practice in order to maintain a healthy and growing church? Or is it, oh, they offended me, I'm out of here. Is walking better? This means that we wake up ready to face each day as this type of person. A forgiving, loving, humble patient person, clothed, prepared, and allowance granted. You know the word forgive? Anytime you have the, 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 the prefix for, it means it's before something, prior to. 
So in other words, he's saying to, to forgive them is prior to their offending you, in advance, you've given them a free pass to hurt me. And I'm going to be okay with it. And that's power. I have the power. I'm telling you, you can offend me and you can hurt me and you can take from me and I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to forgive you. That's awesome power. I have the power. You don't. Martin Luther King Jr., awesome guy. Look over that park in Leesburg. Remember the name of it. They have all these plaques on the ground of all of his amazing quotes. Just some of them anyway. He's got all these amazing quotes. I love this guy. He's brilliant. I wish I could have one of these quotes, but here's one of them. He speaks perfectly to this situation. He says, forgiveness isn't an occasional act. It's a permanent attitude. It's a permanent attitude. I mean, this is so biblical. Matthew 18, 22, you know, Jesus is asked, well, how many times am I supposed to forgive somebody? He says, seven times? And Jesus is like, no, no, no. Seven times 70. See, some commentators think that Jesus is saying that's such a big number. In other words, endlessly. Just forgive them endlessly. Well, I don't know that that's really the truth. I'm a it is written guy. I think if God wanted us to forgive endlessly, maybe he would have said, well, endlessly. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that is what it means. I don't know, but it's not what it says. But I will say this, 7 times 70, if it's 490 times, hey, that's a great permanent attitude. If I look at someone and say, hey, listen, brother, I'm going to tell you right now, you can disappoint me, hurt me, offend me, rip my heart out 490 times, and I'm still going to be your friend and love you. That's awesome. We're going to be friends for a long time. So whether it's 490 times or countless times, that's a permanent attitude. It's a permanent attitude. Listen, forgiveness is the gospel. You don't deserve forgiveness, but you get it. And they acted wrongly upon you, and so they don't deserve it, but you give it. So, in closing, I'll just say this. If if, if God's word says in Ephesians 8, 29, that it is God's desire that all of us are conformed into the image of Christ. If, if you want to be like Jesus, this is it right here. Right here. Forgiveness.